Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Benjamin Buckler. I teach uh, 20th century and post-war art history in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. And I have the honor to introduce the third lecture today, very briefly. I've also been told to remind you that there will be a special evening of question and answers for William Kentridge on April 23rd at 7.30 in Emerson 105. There are two sources for my brief introduction today. One of them is what turns out to be the first, or certainly one of the first, dissertations written on William Kentridge by Leora Maltz, uh, under the good guidance of my colleague Eva Laya Bochert and Suzanne Blier in the department before I came. As it turns out, in the preparation, it's quite a remarkable dissertation. And the second text to whom I owe quite a bit is Rosalind Krauss's extraordinary essay on William Kentridge that she wrote about 10 years ago. Um, so, and of course, most of all, I think having attended the first two of the lectures was an extraordinary introduction into the work and into the thinking of Kentridge. I start with a quote which is a bit paradoxical. He says, public speaking, thinking on my feet were natural and easy skills. We have noticed that by now. Being an artist was a very unnatural and hard thing for me to do, end of quote. And here are some of the fundamental contradictions that constitute the enormous scope of William Kentridge's drawings and films and that have positioned him at the forefront of a counter-modernist project, a place that he shares possibly with the German artist Anselm Kiefer. Both artists attempt to resuscitate antiquated and obsolete forms of representation and figuration to operate as mnemonic conduits. Contemplating history through the lenses of obsolescence attempts to seduce the spectator to open up their armor of cultural and political repression after traumatic rule. Mnemonic cures against social and political disavowals which have governed the particular nation states of these artists, post-fascist Germany and post-apartheid South Africa. Thus, these returns to the obsolete forms of figuration seem to treat the repressed historical memory homeopathically with antiquated forms of representation. Or, as Leora Maltz has succinctly described it, I quote, the geographically transplanted, temporarily delayed, willfully misunderstood, ironic nostalgia of Kentridge's cross-cultural operations. <laughs> Kentridge seems to argue that a return to artisanal figuration based on the great traditions of political drawings and caricatures from Goya through Daumier from Max Beckmann through George Gross, could be a necessary, if not the solely operative medium within which subjects would confront their own deeply disavowed histories. Yet the artist is fully aware of the contradictions inherent in such a project, knowing as he does that to endow drawing with the task of an iconicity of historical memory is hazardous and precarious. First of all, because historical recollection is an anamnetic process, not the result of an iconic depiction. And an actually adequate, let alone comprehensible, representation of the political events might never be achieved. Therefore, many of Kentridge's drawings generate an uncanny duality, multiplicity, of remembering rather than the particular focus of a historical event. Thus, a depiction of Felix Teitelbaum's room in South Africa suddenly appears to us in the manner of Kazimir Malevich's installation at the last Futurist Exhibition 010 in Moscow in 1915. And an image from the mines of South Africa seems to have been based on a photograph from Buchenwald. I quote Kentridge, these two elements, our history and the moral imperative arising from that are the factors for making that personal beacon rise into the immovable rock of apartheid. To escape this rock is the job of the artist. These two constitute the tyranny of our history, and escape is necessary 
for, as I stated, the rock is possessive and inimical to good work. I am not saying that apartheid or indeed redemption are not worthy of representation, description, or exploration. I am saying that the scale and weight with which this rock presents itself is inimical to that task. End of quote. Rosen Krauss, one of Kentridge's most astute and early critical supporters, argues that in the age of spectacle, it is impossible for the memory of apartheid not to be itself spectacularized, as in the sessions of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission broadcast nightly on South African television. And I quote, as we are learning from the Holocaust, it is extremely hard for the business of memory not to be exploited to the point of becoming a business itself. This might be one of the reasons, end of quote, that Kentridge does not just make traditional drawings, but that he suspends the drawing process within the technological mediation of the cinematic, the animated drawings he had produced since 1989, calling them Stone Age animation. Thus, the artist situates his work explicitly on a dialectical axis of contemporary media culture and the primeval archaisms to which the artistic hand supposedly can still provide access. When describing the workings of the unconscious process in drawing, Kentridge once again intriguingly reverts to a mythical, mystical figure, pardon me, a mythical figure of Fortuna from classical antiquity. In his lecture, Neither Program Nor Chance in the Making of Images, Kentridge defines Fortuna, quote, as the general term I use for this range of agencies, something other than cold statistical chance and something too outside of the range of rational control. Thus, once again, we are confronted with a strangely antiquated model. The representations of the unconscious result neither from a supposedly free association of the psychoanalytical cure, talking cure, nor from a totally aleatory organization following Cage's chance principles. Both seem to be rejected by Kentridge in favor of drawing as a process in which, as the artist puts it, the very activity of speaking generated by the act itself, new connections and thoughts emerge. In the indeterminacy of drawing, the contingent way that images arrive in the work, that drawing can provide some kind of model of how we live our lives. Please welcome William Kentridge. When I was eight or nine years old, I made a list, which I'm sure is similar to a list made by many children of that age. It was written in a school exercise book, and it went as follows. William Kentridge, desk 12, standard one, King Edward VII Preparatory School, Houghton, Johannesburg, my city, the Transvaal, the province of the country, South Africa, Africa, the Southern Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way, and the universe. So a spiraling upwards, a huge tornado upwards from the exercise book out to the very edges of the universe. Or else read downwards, a huge storm swirling down, taking everything that there was, landing on the desk, on me, pinpointing who I was in that city, at that desk, at that time. Now, there was another expanding list I could write, which started again, William Kentridge. And then it had two parents. And then it had four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, in a few generations, more than I could calculate. Again, a history of the universe landing in this book. And it was the pressure of everything that had come before landing on this particular point. But it was a list, of course, that could go downwards as well. It could go down from me to possibly William Kentridge to a wife. It could continue downwards to 
one, two, I don't know, three, four, six children, to seven, eight, 16 grandchildren, more and more great-grandchildren, X, X number of great-great-grandchildren, and so on, an expanding list downwards into future generations. Bringing with it a sense of being caught in the crosshairs, being caught on the X point, the center of the X. Expanding in both directions, not in eight at eight, expressed in these terms, but with a sense of particu particularity, of particularness, uniqueness, and of chance, the haphazardness of being exactly who one was and nothing else of being the pinhole in the sheet of paper through which the sun would shine and make its shadow of the sun and the crescent of the moon on the sheet of paper below. The sense of the self like an eye of a needle. Trying in some unspoken way at that age to fix that which was me, as all children do, and everything else that is beyond and outside of it. Now, the lecture today is about memory and geography and the mapping of them, and that is to say it is about landscape. But it is also about contingency, about the improbable combination of events and forces that make that particular X point of pressure. To recapitulate, in the first lecture we looked at Plato and shadows and the start of the program of bringing knowledge from darkness out into light. In the second lecture, we looked further at the shadow itself of the Enlightenment, looking at how it manifested in the colonial project in Africa. Today, we narrow the focus down further from Africa down specifically to Johannesburg, city at the southern part of Africa, where I have lived for the last uh, 56 years, for all my 56 years. Again, as a reference to the lecture that will follow, we will start with a film. In this case, it is uh, the fourth film in a series of 10 charcoal animated films which have been made over the last 23 years. Uh, this film was made, I think, 18 or 19 years ago, and it is approximately six minutes long.
Almost all the large cities in the world have a geographical raison d'etre. They're at the mouth of a river, they're at a harbor, they're on the trade route, they're at the foot of a mountain, close to a mountain pass. There's a geographic lateral reason for their existence. Johannesburg, the city where I've lived for 56 years, has no such geographical raison d'etre. It has an entirely geological, vertical justification. There is a two billion year history of the city. About 100 kilometers from Johannesburg is the center of the world's largest meteor impact site, the Frieda Fort Dome. And this impact site can be identified by a ring of hills in a circle around the point in an otherwise flat landscape where the meteor landed. And one of the results of this impact was to push a section of the Earth's crust which contained a thin seam of gold down at an angle. At the site of impact, that layer of the Earth is approximately three kilometers, a mile and three quarters under the Earth's surface and it makes its way up to the surface at this angle to a point 100 kilometers, 60 miles away from that impact site. At this point, which is about four miles away from where my studio is, this thin seam of gold reached the surface and was discovered 130 years ago. And the city of Johannesburg was established. The city was established and still largely is based on following this ribbon of earth downwards, down into the ground. The seam of ore is about 10 to 12 inches thick, and it's in very thin quantities in the rock. And so mountains of rock has to be dynamited, drilled, loaded onto cocoa pans, brought to the surface where it will be crushed, processed, and then grain by grain, gram by gram, ounce by ounce, the gold leached out of the rock. So one has armies of miners underground, making an expanding series of tunnels below the surface, making our own caves of darkness. There's also a two million year history of the, of the city. That was the two billion year history. About three years ago in Dolomite Caves, which are about 14 miles north of where the studio is, two skeletons were found which are the most intact hominid fossils yet discovered. In the pieces of rock, which you can see both in that site, 16 miles away, or in the University Archaeology Department, you can see a paper-thin trace of a scapula. The bone is still there. A handful of molars look much like ours, but with the surprising weight of teeth turned to stone. These fossils were the early cousins of who we became, somewhere between the small-brained Australopithecus and the larger-brained Homo sapiens that became us. Now, all fossils are about contingency. There have to be a number of unlikely chance events that come together for them to exist and survive. In this case, one starts with the dolomitic structure of the cave of the landscape just north of Johannesburg which caves are eaten out into that stone. Secondly is the chance of being an entrance to the cave, which was at a height to kill things that fell down. So an adult mother and a 10-year-old boy fell through the hole into the cave and were killed. The next essential thing for the preservation of the fossils like that was an absence of predators. No predators who fell into that hole survived either. The next thing was it was not sufficient to have underground water which would slowly move the bones about, there had to be a kind of underground mudslide that in one moment covered both mother and child and allowed them to be preserved and gradually turned into rock. And then there are later contingencies. The first would be the fact that almost all the caves in this area north of Johannesburg were dynamited to get the limestone out of the rock to make cement for the growing city. And the final piece of contingency was again coming from outside of the ground, right up in the satellite realm, where the place of the caves was identified using GPS and Google Earth, 
where what one could identify from Google Earth were certain patterns of undergrowth of trees, of grouping of trees together that suggested the formation of hollows and caves below that. And so using Google Earth, these caves were, and this particular cave was, identified. And these fossils were found at a depth of less than two yards. As if in the two million years, these images and traces could only push themselves down into the ground two meters. As if the two billion year history could only push itself down three kilometers, a mile and three quarters, into the earth. We are here again at this X point, at this X point of pressure. This difficulty, an awareness of the hardness of images penetrating down into the ground and the extraordinary speed and ease of them leaving the Earth going out at 186,000 miles per second. There is then also a 100,000 year history of the city. There are Stone Age settlements identified around the hills around Johannesburg and a thousand year history of Iron Age foundries uh, and furnaces on some of the Johannesburg uh, ridges. But the city itself started only in 1886, 126 years ago, when gold was discovered. For the first 30 years of its existence, Johannesburg was the fastest growing city in the world. And there is a map made of the city that was drawn up three years after the discovery of gold. In it, the whole city is depicted with buildings identified. Now, the map is three things. It is a record of the terrain, of the ridges, of the streams, the contours of the land, the line of the gold seam. Secondly, it is a record of interventions on the land, of buildings, of roads constructed, the damming of streams to make a water reservoir. It is a record of the names of streets, theaters. There were four theaters, including the Globe, three newspaper offices, churches of seven denominations, clubs, hotels, sports facilities, areas set aside for black laborers, for white mine managers, for Indian washermen. But the map is also a projection, a wish, a vision of a possible city. At the time that this map was drawn and printed, only about 3% of the streets and buildings that were drawn were actually built. But it is extraordinary that now, 120 years later, you can still use this map to navigate around the city. In the way that a drawing is a membrane between the world coming towards us and our projection onto that membrane, onto the world, and our projected understanding of that world, a negotiation between ourselves and that which is outside, this map becomes an emblematic drawing having as its conscious subject this meeting of the world as it comes to us and our expanded projection onto the world. At around 1900, at the end of the war between the British and the Afrikaners over control over the gold mines, the city of Johannesburg, wanting to keep all the demobilized soldiers busy rather than drunk, employed them all at a penny a tree to plant trees and to plant a forest of a million trees on the pavements and in the gardens of the city. Johannesburg, by its own and some other estimations, is the largest man-made forest in the world. From my studio, you look out into a lush, undulating sea of tree trees. The gardens of these leafy suburbs are lush and dense. Whereas the land outside Johannesburg is dry, dusty, inhospitable. Scrubby trees, stony ground, thorns, stones, red dust. The edge of the suburbs marks the end of irrigation and of privilege. And water is a charged material here. There's not enough surface water, and so water for drinking and for industry has to be pumped from 100 kilometers away sometimes from Lesotho, several hundred kilometers away. The streams of the city itself are miserable ditches and culverts. Stormwater drains, awaiting rainstorms. But underground, where the mining is, it is the reverse. Underground, there is too much water. And so the water has to be continually pumped out, otherwise it floods the mines and the stopes and the shafts. 
And this pumping out of the water leaves in its wake great sinus cavities in the rock, making the earth vulnerable to collapse. And in my childhood, a smooth patch of road would suddenly disappear into a sinkhole. There were stories of an entire tennis match with the umpire in his high chair and the juice and the cakes next to the court, uh, the family Labrador, all being swallowed up by one of such sinkhole, never to be recovered, with just the tail of the Chevrolet Impala sticking out of the ground to show where the suburban life had once been. Now, this was both a terror in itself, the fear that the city itself could sink into the ground, but more than that, it became an indication of instability, of a world under the ground which we knew about but did not see. Now, this vertical separation between the life on top and the life going on down below had other, more visible, horizontal equivalents in the city. There were white areas, there were areas set aside for African miners, there were areas set aside for colored people, for Indians, for mixed race coloreds. As a white child, I knew they were there, but did not see them. They were behind the mine dumps, they were outside the city. And this invisibility underground had echoes with other things not seen in the city of the mine compounds with their rows of concrete beds, of miners singing underground, of the unstable foundations of the lush gardens and houses in which we lived. A geological sense not just of the structure of the city, but of its politics. So the rumblings of the earth, where the teacups would rattle, where the shelves would shake, the windows would shake, with the small earth tremors as the earth readjusted itself to the holes made by the mining, were kind of messages from down below. A message from the dark underground caves, from the stopes and the passageways of the mines below. So water became both a wish. If only there was water, we could have a lush landscape, we could have a river, we could have a sea, and all went with, with, that went with them. But it was also a threat a drowning threat, that with the removal you could be drowned in the earth itself. Now, land is an unreliable witness. It is not that it effaces all history, but that events and history has to be excavated, sought after in traces, in half-hidden clues. There is a similarity to what happens in the landscape, to what the land itself does, and to the way that our to the way that our memories operate. Things which seemed so completely clear and embedded, either in the landscape or in images in our head, fade, become less clear. Something that provokes a shock and outrage that we should live by becomes dull. And we have to work to find that first, what feels like the truest initial impulse. A forest that we know contained mass, a forest that we know con that contained mass killings is now just filled with the sound of wind in the leaves. Only maybe a section where the trees are slightly shorter in a straight line makes us aware of the spot where there is a mass grave. A change of color in the vegetation marks where there were once foundations of a prison block. What should be proclaimed clearly, here, this happened, let us not forget, becomes ever thinner and harder and harder to discern. And the landscape and our memories together push it away further and further until we get lost in the undergrowth. And even our outrage is lost and turns perhaps into a double regret. A regret of both what happened and a regret at our inability to hold on to it the regret that our first impulse is not stronger. And so we are deceived both by our memory and by the landscape. Not perhaps deceived, but disappointed, betrayed. The landscape itself should be that much stronger. I remember some years ago taking a train from Munich to Dachau. And the shock when you arrive at Dachau train station, where there are posters inviting you to see, visit Schloss Dachau, or to try the wares of Dachau Konditorei, 
when it seemed to me from never having been there that the name itself should have such a power to blast the whole area into barrenness. And I had to recalibrate my sense of geography, to change in my head my imagined Dachau to the suburban reality. And it is a suburb, women with shopping baskets walking past the site of what was the concentration camps, much as they would have in the 1930s and 40s walking past the actual site of the concentration camps trying to understand that for the town, it understood it as 12 bad years in its 800-year history. But also feeling what one loses in the recalibration. Understanding the world as it is, but trying to hold on to that first, that first strong impulse. The strength of, of an emotion of something seen and clearly felt. Finding the traces, the edge of a foundation, the straight line of trees is the most we can do. And there is no good solution. We know that when we put up a sign or a label or a monument to say this event happened in this space, this monument is erected in the memory of, we admit defeat. We hand the responsibility of memory to the sign, to the object. And then the memory becomes a kind of canned memory, the way that laughter on television is canned laughter. The laughter on television does the job of laughing on our behalf. The sign and the monument does the job of remembering the event on our behalf. We are let off the hook. And it feels we need the terrain of the half-solved and the half-solvable riddle of the distance between knowing and not knowing, of seeing the trace in the ground but being still somewhat uncertain of what it is, of not having the clear label that tells us everything. Being aware of the limits of our understanding, the limits of our memory, but prodding the memory nonetheless. Now, when I was nine years old, I went to art lessons. At the first lesson, I was asked by my teacher what I wanted to draw, and I said, landscape. And where I even, even knew the word from, I'm not certain. My grandfather did give me a book, a Hanukkah present, of great landscape paintings of the world, with a landscape of tr an avenue of trees by Hobbema on the cover, paintings from Poussin to Constable to the Douanier Rousseau. But I think this was years later. And how do you want to work, the teacher asked me. And I said, charcoal. Again, I'm not sure where the answer came from. I don't think I'd ever used charcoal before. But these words, landscape and charcoal, somehow were associated with art and doing, making art. So the question is, what kind of a landscape does a nine-year-old white Johannesburg boy make? Now, every Friday night, my sister and I would go to my grandparents' flat for dinner. And over the dining room table hung a large painting by the South African artist Tinus de Jong. The painting showed a mountain in the background, a river in the foreground, leafy trees in between. And I was struck by how the flecks of yellow paint could become rocks seen through the tree branches. How the horizontal strokes of paint made the surface of the water and how the vertical strokes made the reflections in the water. By the transformation of paint into the world and of the world into paint. With your nose against the canvas, it was all canvas and paint, but take two steps back and it became illusion. Now, now this was a landscape with mountains, shade, color, water. It was the opposite of what we had. No mountains, the grass parched, desaturated yellow in winter, no rivers at best, a ditch. The landscape and the picturesque became synonymous. They needed, and we needed, a view framed by lush trees with layers of foliage. We needed a baroque set of planes of events receding into the distance. It was more than this. It was not just how pictures should be made, what constituted a landscape, but what the world should be, an ordered, structured progression from the depth of painting to the foreground of the canvas. Now, this image of the world was in part, I'm sure, derived from English children's books, 
in the library, their pictures and texts became half of who, who we were. We deserved what was in them. And the dissatisfaction with the Johannesburg landscape reflected a larger dissatisfaction. The world depicted in these children's book of vicars, of parsonages, of foxes, of woods, were all absent. And it felt that our landscape, our lives were at fault rather than the fiction. The map could not be completed. The gap between what came from the world towards us the barbed wire fences, the hill with stones and thorns that we met when the family went on a picnic outside the city could not be mapped onto the soft grass, the rolling hills, and the spreading trees that were implied in the picnic basket and the blanket we'd taken us with us in the car to have the picnic. This impasse, this non-meeting of the world and our projected wish onto it was always expressed in disputes inside the motor car. Disputes as to where we should turn off, which dust road we should leave to get to the next dust road. And the sealed seething inside the car was the pressurized point, the center of this impossibility of mapping what we wished and that which we had. Now, I'm not sure what drawing I made at that first drawing lesson, but I'm sure it was not either of barbed wire, nor of stones or thorns, it was only later on, when I came back to draw the landscape around Johannesburg, that it struck me that the drawings I then made started out as a kind of revenge, a revenge against the landscape. However non the landscape was, however null the drawing could track and trace it, however bleaked and parched the view was, it could be put down on paper. However unstructured by the dictates of the picturesque, in the drawing, I could record the non-landscape. The drawings became images of traces, of tracts in the landscape, structured by lines and objects, abandoned civil engineering projects, pipes, a culvert. Now, in the winter on the high felt, the area around Johannesburg, there are felt fires, and the yellow grass there becomes a black stubble. It becomes a charcoal drawing in itself. You could take a piece of paper across the ground, drag the sheet of paper across the ground, and you would have a charcoal drawing in your hand. I mean, it's literally the world meeting drawing halfway, in image, in tone, in material. The straight lines on the ground, the power lines, the culverts, the pipes, they're like a, a drawing in vanishing point perspective. To go back to the nine-year-old again at the art lesson and his landscape, what had he seen and what could he draw? The landscapes of books, of illustrations and stories, the painting in his grandfather's flat, the reproduction of a Cezanne landscape in his parents' bedroom, the brilliance of sunlight coming through the green leaves of the trees at his school, the yellow mine dumps at the edge of the city, the felt beyond that. to pinpoint a Johannesburg childhood even more precisely. Two things that were seen but never spoken of. Driving with his grandfather who had given him the book of landscape paintings, passing a side street, a glance, and there's a man lying in the gutter. Four men around the man kicking his body, kicking his head which was about the shock of adult violence. The nine-year-old knows about kicking someone, but to kick a person in the head, in the face. The world has to rearrange itself to accommodate this new knowledge. The image was seen, they passed, no mention was ever made. When he is six, he goes into his father's study and he sees a thin yellow box like a box of chocolates the lid is carefully opened inside is not the thin wax covering of the top layer of chocolates but a sheaf of 10 by 12 inch glossy black and white photographs a man lies face downwards a dot and a dark stain in the center of his checkered jacket the next photograph the man rolled over an incomprehensible confusion of shirt, 
jacket, viscera, the whole chest disintegrated by the exit wound of the bullet. The photos continued. A policeman looking down at a woman, arms splayed, shopping bag still in her hand, her head against the pavement. A larger view, people crouching, running towards us, the cameraman. Then photographed from behind, people lying spread across the felt. A man sitting dazed his head in his hand, a policeman standing on top of an armored vehicle. Another chest, is it a man, is it a woman, completely blown apart. He closes the box, he, box, he puts it back on the shelf, he puts, puts a book on top of the box to hide what he's done. It is more than this should not happen, this should not be seen. He should not have seen it. It's not as strong as feeling that seeing it made it happen, but there is a complicity between the event and looking at it. Now, these were photographs of the Sharpeville massacre in 1960 in which 69 black protesters, people protesting the pass laws, were shot in a township outside Vereniging, some 50 miles from Johannesburg. My father was the lawyer representing the families at the inquest, and the photographs would have been part of the evidence shown to the court at the inquest. That means I would have been six years old. And I did not ever tell my father that we had both looked at those photographs. So when I was at the art lesson, this too I had seen, the violence, the bodies in the felt. Not only the Cezanne and the Poussin and the Tinus de Jong, it was not that the two worlds didn't come together, but that there felt to be no need for them to come together. The one was art, the other was life, family, friends, school, the world. There were two parallel streams, one going from Michelangelo's judgment to the bar at the Folie Bergère. The other stream was the growing awareness of the unnaturalness of Johannesburg life, the fault line glimpsed, the sinkhole in Carltonville, the man in the gutter, the bullet wounds in the photographs. Perhaps here just to give a brief trajectory from the nine-year-old to where we are now. At 15, I was doing evening art classes with my mother in the salt mines of life drawing and drawing still lives where I first came across the drawings of Dumili Feni, a remarkable South African artist who worked with large-scale figurative drawings. Then to the university and to the Johannesburg Art Foundation under its remarkable teacher, Bill Ainsley, to do painting. Now in the mid-1970s, one has to remember that in Johannesburg, painting was about edge and surface. Jules Elitsky, Larry Poons were the kings of painting to which one had to look and tried to emulate, and I failed. I failed to be able to paint like that. My mantra to myself at that stage was, you do not have the right to be an artist. You do not have the right to be an artist. And there is a way in which one can always write one's biography in terms of being rescued by one's failures. But at the time, this simply felt like a failure. So I decided I could not be an artist, I sold my etching press, stopped thinking of myself in those terms, and went to Paris to learn how to be an actor at a theater school, where I discovered after three weeks I should not be an actor. <laughs> Again, in retrospect, I have to think that I was saved by that failure. If I'd been slightly less bad at it, I might have had a miserable life as wondering why I never got to play the king was always the th third sword bearer in the production. And I came back to Johannesburg deciding, well, I couldn't be an artist, I couldn't be an actor, I would work in film industry. But working in the film industry, in the South African film industry, meant essentially carrying my friend's furniture onto different film sets. And I was, again, failed at that. Again, if I'd been slightly less terrible at production design, that could have been my life in the South African television industry. But I failed at that again and found myself after many years, reduced to being an artist. <laughs> and I did this while always thinking, well, at some point I'll get a real job. I promised my friends I'm doing this while I'm working out what I'm really going to do. And this continued for a while until a friend of mine said in no uncertain terms, he said, understand you are 30. You've never had a real job. No one will give you a job. You are unemployable. 
So wipe your nose on your sleeve and stop this complaining and whining and get on with it. Now, there are no long traditions in Johannesburg, only that which has been imported and constructed. Traditions imported, still in their boxes, instruction manuals absent. First, English Cornish miners came to work in the, in the mines, then Chinese indentured miners were brought in, African miners from Mozambique, Nyasaland, different corners of South Africa. Following the pogroms of the 1880s, Jews fled Lithuania, and many of them, including my family, ended up in South Africa, and after gold was discovered, moved to Johannesburg. Traders, Indian traders, came from Gujarat. And it's not that there was an easy mixing of groups. Jews stayed largely with Jews. Indian traders from Gujarat met largely with Indian tra traders from Gujarat, Mozambicans with Mozambicans. But there were points of intersection and the weight of a single tradition was less. Even the weight of Europe hanging over all of us there in this colony at the southern end of Africa, over the heads of school children and students, was understood in a colonial way. Believing that we misunderstood the great texts, but reconstructing the great texts as if they might have meant X, as if this is what they could have meant. Now, the productive misunderstanding and mistranslation became and become essential. The sense of being at the edge of a tradition, at the corner of great works, they both instill a colonial fear of misunderstanding, of being less smart, less wise than those people in Europe or North America. But it also made for a freedom in the leaps which could be made, in how a tradition could be taken, elements taken from it, without the tradition having to be having to be mastered, filling, the, in the, the, filling in the sections that we assumed we did not understand. Now, in the studio, this becomes an improvisation with traditions, a collage of fragments of different modernisms. Now, broken reports did reach us. We heard astonishing reports about a real pump, pumping real honey through a building. We heard about a pile of bricks in a museum as an artwork how a student protest was now called a social sculpture. Now, none of this was comprehensible or familiar, familiar, but all of it was there to be used or abused from whatever possible meanings we could construct from these, on the surface, incomprehensible activities and images. Now, the second most illustrious citizen of Johannesburg came to South Africa as a young lawyer. He was from a high-caste Hindi family. Gandhi arrived in Johannesburg to look after the legal interests of Indian traders. He was not interested in Indian mysticism. He had no knowledge of Sanskrit. And Gandhi's transformation in the 20 years, he was in Johannesburg for 20 years, came through several sources. First, his observation of Muslim passive protests, of Muslim activists who urged Indians to go to jail rather than to obey oppressive new laws being brought in to control the movements of Indians. Secondly, it came through contact with a group of Jewish intellectuals and architects who gave him John Ruskin's book, Unto This Last, to read, and who introduced him to Indian mysticism. Now, this introduction to Indian mysticism was done through theosophy. Now, theosophy was the invention of a Russian, Madame Blavatsky, and her American colleague, Henry Steele Olcott. And this is a mixture of Victorian talking to the dead and fragments of spirituality from Hinduism and Buddhism. So through this Russian, American, English, German, Jewish mixture, Gandhi came to the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> he came back to his tradition, rethinking his political philosophy, and he did this all while in detention at the prison in Johannesburg around 1908. It was here that he developed his philosophy and politics of Sajjadraga. He was not a scholar of Indian philosophy. His education had been outside the tradition entirely. He was a smartly dressed English barrister. And when he came back to his tradition, it was through mistranslation, through the use and misuse of the text that the text had been subject to. 
the tradition bastardized, approached from the side, not to continue it or pay homage to it, but to use it as raw material in the service of some other end. In this way, Johannesburg becomes a cosmopolitan city, a city of possible transformations. Gandhi could escape his caste position and make connections and political leaps that would have been virtually impossible in India. And the city and the studio meet in the form of collage, of disintegration, of delight in the disintegration, of the reconstructability of ideas, of images, of physical space, in the making and unmaking of images in the studio. There is not a script or a storyboard, and contingency becomes vital in this. As Professor Buchlow explained, the balance between a program and a chance action in what I once described as Fortuna is vital here. If we think back to the image in the first film I showed of the man in the bed with his coffee and he first he rings a bell and then coffee pot arrives, a French press and then he plunges the coffee and it goes through the coffee pot down into the bed and down into the mine. To talk a little about the specifics of that image. When I was making the film, I had the question of how do I get the man from his bed down into the mine? And I thought, well, I have to draw him getting out of bed. I have to draw him leaving the house. I have to draw him driving after arriving at the mine, going into a building, getting into the lift, going down to the mine. And this seemed an enormous journey to be done. So while waiting to think how to solve the problem, so that some material was still being done, I tried different things. And the first one was him ringing a bell. Nothing happens. He rings a bell, no result. The second was drawing the coffee pot, which I thought, all right, you'll have a pot of coffee, he can be smoking, and tomorrow I'll solve the problem of how to get him down to the mine. In the meantime, I'll get 10 seconds of him having coffee. <laughs> and that involved drawing the plunger and redrawing, erasing, redrawing, and filming it. And it was only somewhere halfway down the coffee pot that I suddenly understood that the plunger didn't have to stop at the bottom of the pot, but could go down further. And the question is where that came from. Now, I spoke in the first lecture about the separation between the artist as someone making the image and someone looking at the image, which is a kind of horizontal separation. But I want to talk about a third kind of separation of the self that is at play here. The coffee pot was drawn because that was in the studio. That was what I was ha having that day. I was having that coffee. And I have to think then, is there another self below those two, the person drawing and the person looking, who in the morning, in the breakfast, in the kitchen were saying, take the coffee pot and take it to the studio. And me saying, well, I don't even want coffee, I'm gonna have tea, and they were saying, believe me, don't question, just take the <laughs> coffee pot and go across. And then at a certain point saying, wait, so that when finally the coffee pot plunged and went through the pot, it wasn't a sense of, gosh, what a good idea, how clever to have worked this out, but rather a sense of stupidity. How could I not have realized that, of course, that was the coffee pot? And so this other self that in some unknown way is the prompt, take the coffee pot, use this, it will have a function. It's not the same as the unconscious. It's not Freud's unconscious. It's a different self. It's a different intelligence that's at operating at the same way before the level of the making, even before the walking, which again is a combination of contingent things contingency allied to some unspecified, unclear understanding. Only in retrospect does everything have a determined inevitability. There is a provisionality in the heart of the city, not just a provisionality of architecture, of theatres, houses, offices built with the confidence of surviving centuries, only for them to be imploded, to make way for new developments each time the economy boomed. The beautiful Art Deco buildings of the nine in the center of the town were demolished in the great boom of the 1960s. The economic boom coinciding with the most brutal, narrow period of apartheid oppression. The provisionality goes further than the city to the landscape itself. Now, hills and mountains are markers of solidity. A rock, the symbol of eternity. A mountain, a symbol of that which cannot be moved. A mountain is a fixed 
static object in a moving world, against which we measure ourselves. And the hills of Johannesburg are a low series of ridges south of the city center. Yellow, flat-topped mountains made from the earth and rock excavated from inside the mines. Some are grassed over and some still stay the yellow cyanide sand color. Now, there are always traces of danger associated with these hills, both from the cyanide and from the threat of the friable earth collapsing. Children playing on the mine dumps every few years, some of them would be swallowed by landslides of these dumps. The wastelands between the dumps had their own dangers of unmarked shafts of the gold mines, stories of thieves and highwaymen hiding inside them. But nonetheless, they were our hills, they were our mountains. You could see them at the ends of the streets of the city. The flat tops were a reassuring view when you returned to the city back from holiday. Then metallurgical techniques changed. And it became possible to extract from the residue the fine amount of gold that was still left inside these hills. The price of gold went up and the hills started disappearing. Another legal note. There was a dispute over these hills. Were these fixed property of the people who owned the land, or were they the movable assets of the people who'd done the mining? While this question was being debated in the courts, trucks and high-pressure hoses arrived at night, and the hills were erased. A drive-in cinema perched on the top of one of the hills the top star was a heritage site. Bill, can we have the image? A drive-in perched on the top of the hills, the top star was a heritage site, but the hill underneath it was not. So even though it was a heritage site, as the ground underneath it was removed, the drive-in screen itself finally was finally dismantled a year ago. So the city becomes its own large-scale animated drawing erasing and redrawing itself. And as the dumps disappear, there is at first a shock at the reconfiguration of the landscape and then a naturalization of the view, as if the dump had never been there. Now, this adap adaptability is more than a flexibility to accept that which happens. It's stronger than that. It is that you cannot remember what it looked like before the dump was removed. And the accompanying regret is the regret at our ease of forgetting. You have to look at a photograph of the dump to remember, oh yes, that's what it was like in the olden days, even if the olden days are just six months before. The photograph, like the monument and like the label on the monument, stands in for memory. And the city itself becomes an object lesson in provisionality, not just in the structure and of its mountains, but of memory itself. To leave the southern edge of the city and come four kilometers down to the studio. And to the technology of trying to track this process. There is a sheet of paper on the wall of the studio, a camera in the center of the room, and a walk between the camera and the wall, adjusting the drawing, walking back to the camera, shooting two frames, walking back to the drawing. Through this backwards and forwards movement, the studio becomes a machine for the alteration of time. First, in the most crass sense, time becomes distance. It becomes matter, it expands, it contracts, it becomes visible. Time becomes distance in two different ways, twice. Now, a film camera is a device for turning time into calculable distance. In traditional film projection, 24 frames of a film have to pass between the lens and the lamp every second. And the 24 frames of 35 millimeter film are 18 inches, 45 and a half centimeters. Time gets turned into distance and number. 1,500 frames a minute or 750 alterations of a drawing if you're changing the drawing every two frames. The invisible substance of time gets turned into the material of film. The ribbon of film both holds and calibrates time. 
You know, if you hold the discus-like roll of film, one is holding duration in your hand. Now, other objects, of course, also embody time. A tree holds in its trunk 200 years. But the roll of films holds time as its essence, the materialization of time. Across the studio in a notebook, time becomes distance again in a different way. I make a sweep of my wrist. I trace an arc on a sheet of paper, and this say takes one and a half seconds. And one and a half seconds is 35 frames. So I divide the arc into 35 different divisions. It's 24 frames per second, plus another half second is 12, so a total of 35, 36 frames. And then I draw each film division, and then return to the camera and shoot two frames, and return to the drawing and complete the next arc. On the paper, the 30 centimeter sweep becomes a series of eight millimeter divisions of the line. And the focus shifts now entirely to these divisions, to the mark, successively joining them up. And time becomes forgotten in the activity of drawing time. Each mark on the paper is a record of the move between the camera and the paper, and the passage of time becomes the ink line. Of course, what stays invisible is the time spent in making it, the 10 minutes to draw this one and a half seconds, the 10 months to make a nine minute film. And this change of a line, of a gesture into discrete marks, stands for a, a larger change. And it stands in for the larger fundamental inversion in the studio. Like the inversion of light as it passes through the pinhole in the aperture of a camera. On the one side of the aperture is the world, everything's happening, coming through the pinhole, through the aperture of the lens. On the other side, it is transformed. Outside you have Sharpville, you have the massacre itself, you have the photographs of the event, you have the city, you have the mind dumps, you have its history, and inside the body of the camera, all is transformed. It's not that the events or history disappears, but they are changed into a series of discrete marks. The world is unmade to be made again. So, drawing a body that is lying in the felt. I might start with a reference of a drawing of a photograph, a police photograph, not the Sharpful photographs, though it could have been. The drawing was made for a film of bodies in the felt. Only after the drawing and the film was finished did I remember the Sharpful photographs. I remembered what I had been drawing long after the drawing was completed. And in the drawing itself, the concentration shifts position. The image becomes a series of marks and decisions. The person shot, the provoking shot, disintegrates into time, tone, line, the contrast of the drawing. Over the paper hovers a projection of the figure, but overlaying it too are all the other bodies. Goya's spread-eagled man from the 3rd of May, Giotto's massacre of the innocents, the flayed skin of Marseilles, but they are also too far from the paper. Right up against the paper, the activity of finding the image is just the material, and the belief that this material will transform itself back into the image, the darkness of the line, the texture, the white over the erased gray. Following these shifts and decisions, the way one would follow the divisions of the line into its 37 sections. Understanding that the cumulative work the labor power extended together with the belief in the activity will make the image emerge. When you write up against the paper, a still life by Chardin or Morandi are as good a guide as any. Anger, distress, desire, all may have been behind the impulse to make the image, but then they get left behind. Time slows down and becomes outside the image. Something that you glimpse for a second may take a day, a week, to draw. And what takes the place of the rage, the outrage, the desire, the grief, 
is rather pleasure, frustration, self-doubt, states which are evoked by the materials and the activity, and they take the place of the initial impulse. There is still some connection to the first thought, but it is put on, on hold. The impulse is sent outside to wait in an antechamber while the actual work is being done. There are other ways in which time becomes thickened with material. Charcoal and paper are not perfect substances. You can erase charcoal very easily, but not perfectly. The paper is tough, it can be erased, redrawn endlessly but not without showing its damage. The erasure is never perfect. A gray smudge of charcoal dust lodged in the fibers of the paper will always remain. In the camera, the film records this alteration and records the dust and the trace and the smudge. And time gets transformed into this charcoal dust and ground paper and fragments of plastic eraser. The hill is neither there as in the photograph, in which it will always be seen, nor is it entirely absent, as in our memories, where we have naturalized its absence. It hovers in the smudges on the paper and in the roll of film in the camera, always awaiting processing and projecting. Now, this provisionality, the uncertainty, the instability, is lodged in the material, in the technique, and in the technology itself. The imperfect erasure is not an artifact, it's not an effect added. It is what the making, the physical making, the drawing, the erasing, the filming, the walking, throws towards us. It is the studio meeting the world halfway. And the walk is vital between the camera and the drawing, not just in how it echoes other walkings around the studio, trying to find an idea, but also again in the separation, as I described, between the making and the looking. There is the drawing that happens, standing close to the sheet of paper, where all becomes lines of charcoal, bits of erasure, white pastel, the wipe of a chamois cloth, and then the walk back to the camera, back to the drawing, which is a reimagining of how the drawing could look. Then there's a turn to walk back to shoot the next frame, the glance, the fresh glance at the drawing on the turn, where the artist sees the drawing again freshly, and the artist as viewer judges, he instructs, he castigates, or else he just gives a nod, just carry on. Now, the city remaking itself is an essentially vertical phenomenon. Buildings, mountains are brought down to ground level and new structures rise up. It's not a lateral pan, taking in a whole cinemascope sweep of a landscape of a city. But a rising and falling in front of us, like the roll of film passing through the gate of the camera, the film having glimpsed the world of light and shade as each frame is held steady, given a glimpse of the outside world, and then sent down into the caves of the take-up spool, as if the film itself could penetrate the earth go down past the cave of the early hominids, go down further to the stopes and passages of the miners, down to the geological time of the meteor impact. As if the whole universe could swirl down from its largest sources, from the origin of the meteor, down to that specific exact space, passing through the eye of the needle, through the aperture of the camera, holding on, showing the compression of time, holding this time in the material of the celluloid. I have described Johannesburg as a city with a lack of geography. No rivers, no seashore, no geographic raison d'etre. Apart from the gardens, we are outside of nature. But there is one category in which we still hang on. We have our local sublime, we don't have the stormy ocean or the mighty Alps or the glaciers of the traditional sublime in which the human is so dwarfed by enormous natural phenomenon that we feel our insignificance and how small we are against the horizon of time and the world and we revel in this revelation. 
In Johannesburg, we have dry winters. In summer, we have heat, and in the afternoons, thunderstorms. And our sublime arrives in the form of huge cumulus nimbus clouds that pile themselves up over the city. Every day when we have a storm, a new mountain range, a new Alps, is built for us again. In the way that the mine dumps can exist, be erased, be rebuilt, so from a clear sky there are these cathedrals of clouds that construct themselves. And we see two things in the clouds. We see shapes, a dog's head, an old man's face with a protruding chin, the back of the head on a shoulder, and it's again not about our ability to see things, it's not an act of generosity to see it. It's about not being able to stop ourselves from seeing these images. The man's head comes to you. Once you've seen it, you cannot stop yourself from seeing it. This is one element of the clouds. The other is the changing itself, the shifting form of them, an awareness of the engine inside the clouds, a force changing the form and the shape. So lying on one's back, looking up at these clouds in the afternoon, there is the seed of understanding that a child gets of the nature of provisionality, of the indwelling tendency outwards, of the tendency that sits inside of something which moves to emerge. Something is growing within, changing the outside form, becoming itself. And I think of myself as a nine-year-old looking at those clouds. And I think of myself as that nine-year-old still stuck inside this frame of this 56-year-old. And I can feel his anxiety as he runs around inside me still. And the nine-year-old is saying, tell him about this, tell him about, tell him about the landscape, tell him that I worked hard, tell him that I wanted to make my mother happy. He gets more and more agitated, this nine-year-old inside. Then the thunder comes and the huge drops of rain. And I say to the nine-year-old, it's all right, it's all right. You don't have to run so hard. Thank you.